Hi everyone, I'm Mike Price, Managing Member and Principal Photographer for Fairfield Photography, LLC. For the next half hour, I'm going to help you get started with Chroma Key as a way to diversify your products, appeal to new customers, and give your existing customers something special. My goal is to share ways that you can easily get your subjects on a transparent background so you can let your creativity go wild and create great composite products. So that we're on the same page of the script, let me show you some of what Fairfield Photography does with Chroma Key. Team and individual sports photography using Chroma Key represents over a third of my business, and it's the best opportunity for innovation and creativity in my market. It differentiates me from others and lets me establish value that can't be easily compared with others. For parents and league leaders, there's no comparison of the appeal of our images versus the traditional single pose sports shots. First, let's agree on a definition of Chroma Key. Chroma Key is efficiently removing the background from images in order to create a composite product. Now throughout this presentation, you'll hear me use the word keying. Keying is instructing software to remove a specific color range from a photo to create a transparent background. Chroma key isn't for every situation. Regardless of whether you're using traditional backgrounds or chroma key, you still have to correctly light the subjects, correctly light the background, properly compose the photo, and create consistent images between subjects and sessions. Chroma Key also presents new challenges you have to be prepared to deal with. There will be issues with green clothing, green reflections, and other green conflicts on your subject. You'll have to learn some new workflow you may not be familiar with. There will be time spent to create product templates and layouts that are innovative and fresh. And finally, you'll need some time to practice and establish confidence in your workflow and new skills. However, in return for your perseverance and expertise, Chroma Key provides you tremendous flexibility with the results, more background choices, fantastic composite potential, and really helps you drive business innovation. Here's the basic setup in place. We use a 10x10 Chroma Key green backdrop with a smaller 8x5 strip at the bottom so we have a continuous background without a lot of extra green material in use. Our lights are set in pretty close to the background since we normally work in tight spaces. I'll explain the lighting more in a minute. Our setup today gives us plenty of room, but we set this up in rooms as small as 16 by 25 feet. We use cotton chroma key background material. The less reflective you can get the material, the better. Shooting on polyester or other shiny material is going to create a green reflection you don't want. If you have a studio, you can purchase chroma key paint that's designed to reduce reflection. So all of our chroma key work involves full height standing photos. We need to have a chroma key area for them to stand on that's the same material and hue as the background. That way, we can knock out the background quickly on the computer. With the lighting we use, we don't need a perfectly smooth background. We always seem to have some wrinkles, regardless of how we set up. So we throw the background a bit out of focus by using a shorter depth of field when we shoot. Since we use two different background pieces, we need to connect them with some clear plastic tape. This also lets us replace the short area of material that athletes stand on and wear out without having to replace the whole backdrop. Be sure you use the same supplier for both pieces of material. Otherwise, you could have two different hues and create big problems in your computer processing. The final step is to use a piece of green tape on the spot where I want each subject to stand. This lets me have confidence in my lighting settings as well as my camera to subject distance throughout the entire shoot. Here's another alternative to simplify your setup if you're not shooting full height shots that include feet. These pop-up backgrounds are handy for small portrait sessions where you're mostly waist up. It has the added benefit of being green on one side and blue on the other when you have situations where your subject is wearing green clothing. You've seen what we do for our backdrops. Now let's take a few minutes and talk about lighting for chroma key. Our umbrellas are pointed to a spot between the subject and the edge of the background so we can light the background and the subject at the same time. I keep our subject about six feet from the main light while the main lights themselves are about seven feet from the background at this angle. We set our lights for equal lighting on both sides since our subjects turn different directions for the poses we use and we don't want to have to lose time when 20 athletes are waiting in line. If you're doing portraits, you can be a bit more creative with your lighting. 
Here's one of the things that's really helped us with separating subjects from the background and improved how our images are processed in the computer. We run a pair of fill lights about one f-stop down from the mains. These are placed back by the backdrop and actually pointed to the back of the subject on both sides. This creates a very flattering rim lighting, plus greatly reduces the amount of green reflection that might wrap around a subject. If you're shooting full height subjects, then you want to point your rim lights up slightly. Otherwise, you end up with too much light at their feet. This creates green reflection on the legs and washed out areas that are more difficult to process in the computer. With all these lights, you need a way to fire them wirelessly. Since we're using Alien B lights, we can use the CyberSync system to not only trigger the lights, but we can also change the power settings for each light wirelessly. This saves us at least 10 minutes each night we set up since we don't have to keep manually adjusting each light to get what we need. Finally, since we run multiple shooting stations at times, we put triggers on all four lights so you don't have to worry about the other stations triggering our lights. We've talked about background, we've talked about lighting, let's take a minute to talk about camera setup. I shoot the camera on manual so I can lock in shutter and aperture for consistent results. I shoot on F5 to shorten depth of field and soften the background wrinkles a bit. Shutter speed is 1 200th of a second. This makes sure that my wireless triggers have time to trigger all the lights and stay within the flash sync speed and also minimizes the amount of ambient light that might sneak in. ISO 100 to 200, again, low enough to minimize the ambient light. Now that my camera's set, there are three other things I do to make my shots consistent. I shoot everything sitting down, not because I'm lazy, but because it creates a better angle to shoot the subjects and reduce how much of the tops of the shoes are shown. Think about it. If you're six foot tall and stand up to shoot a three foot tall peewee athlete, you'll see a lot of the tops of their feet, making the resulting composite look like they're standing on their tiptoes. By sitting, you get a consistent angle that looks more natural when you begin to assemble those images into composites. And yes, if this is a three hour shoot, sitting is an added benefit. The second thing I do is to shoot with a 50 millimeter prime lens. On my full frame Nikon D3s and D4s, the results are more natural portrait perspective and it lets me be consistent between subjects. Now when I put together group composites, I generally have the right heights of each player when I put the resulting images together. The third thing I do is to put my chair about eight feet back from the front of the backdrop and mark the spot with tape so I always shoot from the same subject to camera distance all day. The combination of shooting lower, using a prime lens, and consistent camera to subject distance allows me to create consistent images for faster compositing later. So when we put it all together, here's what a night of shooting looks like to us from setup to pack up.
And that's it. Portable, consistent, reliable. Practice before you put an actual customer in front of your screen, and don't be afraid to explore and experiment to make the Chroma Key setup work for you. All right, at this point, let's assume we've performed our photo shoot and have a collection of images properly shot on a green background. Chroma Key techniques can work with portraiture sessions as well, but we found the biggest impact with our sports team customers. Remember what I said about Chroma Key? It's the process of efficiently removing the background. The next few steps aren't specific to Chroma Key, but they're pivotal to a consistent, efficient workflow. Let's start with the consistent folder structure so we know where our original and keyed images will go. In my workflow, I use a folder structure like a waterfall. Starting with original images in the originals folder, I then process selected images into a selections folder of JPEGs that have been cropped and resized to 6 inches on the long side since my final composite product is typically based on an 8x10 print. When cropping, be sure that you've cropped out anything on the edge that isn't the green background in order to be able to use automated chroma key tools later. The selected folder now contains images that are ready to be put through the keying process and will end up in the keyed folder. As I build composite products, each file goes into folders based on the template I'm using and eventually into the orders folder for specifically ordered products. At this point, you have three post-process choices with your selected green screen images. You can outsource your chroma key processing, process in-house using native Photoshop tools, or process in-house using third-party tools that are chroma key specific. If you're just getting started or want to try chroma key without a big capital investment, many labs are now offering chroma key background knockout services. If you've created good green screen images, you can send them off and in a few days get transparent PNGs back that are ready to perform your layout work or even have them put them on a background for you. Keep in mind though, the more you give to a lab to do, the less creativity and influence you're going to have on the final product. If you want to do the keying work yourself, you have several options. Photoshop has some great selection and masking tools, and if you're doing just a few images one at a time, you can ultimately achieve a transparent background manually using the built-in tools. In our business though, we typically process several hundred images per league, so anything manual goes against the efficiency part of what we talked about earlier since I would have to hand key hundreds of photos. What you really want is a tool built specifically for chroma key. Something that has an automatic chroma key masking function and that can be embedded in Photoshop Actions to create an efficient, repeatable, and predictable workflow. My tool of choice is Digital Anarchy's Primat plugin for Photoshop. It's available on both the Macintosh and Windows platforms. There are several other products in the market that are dedicated to chroma key processing and you might want to try out their trial versions before you invest. But for me, the one I keep coming back to use as the workhorse for our chroma key is Primat because of the consistent results I get, as well as the ability to embed Primat into Photoshop Actions. All right, enough talk. Let's key some images. Here's an image from a recent photo shoot. Let's open this in Photoshop, unlock the background layer, go to Filters, Digital Anarchy, Primat. The first thing I do in a new installation of Photoshop and Primat is to set this as a keyboard shortcut so I can get to Primat faster in the future. Looking at the Primat screen, here are the important functions that I use. Over here is the Auto Mask function. Auto Mask lets Primat automatically do the keying. If you have a minimum of green conflicts, consistent lighting for your subject and background, chances are you'll be able to use Auto Mask to go through and key all of your images with a minimum of effort. One thing to remember about Primat's Auto Mask. It uses the pixels in the upper left corner to determine the color details to use for keying. If you have some of the background outside of the green background showing, you're going to make auto mask key on the wrong color. This is why I use cropped photos when keying. If you're not using auto mask, you have the ability to set the keying color and refine the background and foreground keying results with these controls here. Overriding the auto mask function is valuable when the team's color scheme is close to the same hue and saturation as the background you're using, or you have other complications that are causing auto mask to not create the results you want. Another important part about the Primat screen is how I select colors. These controls determine whether we're getting a point sample for a color to key off of, or an average of colors inside of a box. I always use the box tool since there might be subtle differences in my background lighting edge to edge, and I find I get better results when I start with using the box tool. Primat also lets you view your results using these two views tools, composite view and mask view. We'll look at these closer in a moment. Finally, I prefer to soften the edge of the keyed image by using the soften matte tool. 
I can refine the edge of the final image by softening and shrinking the edge so I reduce any green that might wrap around the very edge of the image. I've set my soften to 4 and my shrink to 7 and then close the window. If you have hundreds of images to process, you don't want to have to open this panel every time, even with a shortcut key. I embed my chroma key steps into actions to save time. For this demonstration, I'm going to set up a primat action that starts with auto mask getting me close and then doing a few adjustments on the foreground and background settings to improve the keying and get it just the way I want it. I start by creating a new action. The action will remember all my settings for primat that I set using this representative image. Let's name the action Key Soccer Players. First, unlock the background layer. Then, send the image to primat. Remember it's filters, digital anarchy, then primat. Notice in Primat that the gray area represents what AutoMask has already identified as green to be removed. AutoMask does a pretty good job getting me close, and a lot of time I don't even make any corrections. However, in this example, I think I see a few things I want to improve. Now here is where I save some time. I go right to Mask View so I can see the effect of my masking. Looking here, the black area in Mask View shows what's going to be turned transparent, while the white is going to be preserved. Since ultimately we're building a mask in Photoshop, we use the phrase black conceals, white reveals to remember how a mask works. Notice that the small corrections I need to make here by the feet and here on the ball are much easier to spot in mask view. Let's fix them right here. As I said before, I prefer using the box selection tool, so I select it first. first. Click step 2, clean BG color button. This is for the background. Draw the box across the background area to be masked out between the feet. Then, click on Step 3, Clean FG color button. This is for the foreground. Draw across the foreground area to be preserved on the ball, making sure you don't touch any of the background area. Be sure to switch back to Composite View here and click the Trans button to preview your images on a transparent background. If everything's what you're looking for, click the OK button and you'll be returned back to Photoshop. You have now trained Primat as to what colors to keep and what to mask out for this series of images. If you're going to key hundreds of photos, having this in an action is what's going to save you a lot of time and money. You may also find that you'll create several actions if your league uses several different team colors, since you'll want to train it for the unique colors of the team. Just to round out our action, we need to put a Save As step in our action, and save it as a layered PSD or TIFF file. If you save this as a JPEG at this point, all of your hard work to make a transparent background will be changed into solid white and you'll have to start over again. I can now run this action as a batch and have it knock out backgrounds for 1, 100, or 1000 green screen image files. If you're like me, while the batch action is running, this is a good time to clean up your gear, put things away, or spend some time with your family while the computer does all the work. And here we have it. All the images keyed and ready to composite. Take a moment here and go back and look for obvious exceptions big things you're looking for is green clothing and green spill over onto important parts of the image. These will show up as transparent holes in the final image where you wouldn't expect to see transparency. This is a great time to talk about how precise you need to be with keying. Whether some green spill or unintended transparency is a problem depends on how you're using the image. We found that when dealing with images of subjects that are from head to toe, in other words full height photos, Small areas of transparency where the background shows through will hardly be noticeable in the resulting photos. When you're dealing with close-ups, however, with a lot of emphasis on the athlete's face, precision becomes more important. For now, you'll just want to go back and correct the handful of problem images you might encounter using the refinement tools in Primat using one image at a time instead of through an action. We'll cover common challenges with chroma key in detail in just a few minutes. Let's review the important elements of chroma key workflow. First, set up a shortcut key to get to your tool fast. Second, embed the keying process into a Photoshop action and use batch processing to save time and money when you have a lot of images to process. Third, always unlock your background layer before running Primat. Again, an action helps to remember this. Fourth, soften the edges using the Soften Matte tool. Fifth, try Auto Mask first. Then, use manual keying settings if you need even tighter control. Finally, Use your composite view versus the mask view and refine your keying until you get the template just the way you want it. At this point, your keyed images are ready to be combined into composites. Okay, I can just hear everyone out there going, but, 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 but. 
it's okay. I was in the same place you are when I started. Here's some of the common problems you're going to run into. Green clothing. Despite your best efforts to tell the subject otherwise, someone will always end up wearing green socks, green shoes, green undershirts, or something with green trim. You want to preserve the green color and spend as little time as possible to deal with it. Green spill, on the other hand, is from reflections of the background. Many times you want to remove green spill because it's going to create a transparency where you don't want one, and you also want to remove the green cast from the final image while preserving underlying detail. Finally, hair. Blonde and fuzzy hair can become a challenge that needs to be handled without giving the subject a digital haircut. So let's walk through these together and you'll see they aren't as much a problem as you think. Green clothing is the most common problem you'll run into. If you're photographing subjects that have clothing of the same hue and saturation as your green background, one option is to shoot them on blue screen instead of green. If you have just a few elements of green in the photo, more than half the time I can have Primat key the green if I open the problem image directly into Primat and give the plug in a bit more refinement as to what to keep and what to remove. When rerunning Primat can't key the image the way I like, my next step is to use a garbage mask. A garbage mask is like putting a fence around the parts of the image you don't want to have keyed before running the chroma key tool. In Photoshop, grab a lasso tool or marquee tool, draw around the area of the image you don't want Primat to look at, then invert your selection. You've now created a selection that you want Primat to key and to ignore the area you originally lassoed before you inverted the selection. Now run Primat again. We can see the effect of the garbage mask here by looking at the mask view to see what was ignored by the chroma key tool. Be sure to change back into composite view before exiting Primat. Click OK. You can see that Primat ignored the part we fenced off. A good Photoshop operator, armed with a lasso tool, a tablet and stylus, plus some good keyboard shortcuts can usually do garbage mask corrections in 15 to 20 seconds per image. Green spill is where we're getting a reflection from the green background on skin or sports implement. Unlike the green clothing issue where we wanted to preserve the green of the uniform, green spill is green that is mixed in with important parts of the photo that we want to go away without just punching a hole in the subject with unwanted transparency. Remember, the software is only looking for that shade of green to remove and doesn't know the difference between a cloth background, skin, or a soccer ball. In this example, we have an athlete holding a soccer ball. If we just do our regular primat step, you'll see that a big part of the bottom of the ball disappears. This is more than trivial and needs to be fixed. When we do a garbage mask, we solve half the problem. There is still green reflection on the ball, but we have at least preserved the roundness of the ball. One technique that works well for us in this situation is as soon as we return from Primat, we again invert the garbage mask selection so that only the garbage mask area is selected, and then we use the Replace Color tool. Since we're limiting our changes to just the area contained in the mask, we won't affect anything else. Select the green spill you want to remove, then change the color to one that better fits into the image. For the soccer ball, we use a white color and then adjust the saturation and lightness to blend the green into a white that matches the ball. We've also been able to do this with various skin tones to help remove the green cast from shiny skin. The last common challenge I'll talk about is with some types of hair. Blonde hair and frizzy hair are the most frequent situations that require special attention. When regular keying won't work, our solution to this is to use a two-pass keying technique. We first key the image with the hair by using the square marquee tool to draw around the head. We do a normal keying step here so that we have a good, clean, keyed area around the head. I find that clicking auto mask here creates a great mask most times and gets you around most hair challenges. Now we invert the selection so we exclude the head and hair and key the remaining part of the image. Run Primat again. Look at the mask view. We see that Primat is ignoring the head this time and we have a great looking image. Here are a few actions that I've built that I use every day in my chroma key work. This is the keying base template. I create one of these for each keying color I'm going to batch process for a session. It first unlocks the background layer, then it duplicates the original green screen layer before hiding it. Then it selects layer 0, which has the visible green screen layer on it. The action then runs Primat, which I've trained with new colors each time I prepare this action. 
it runs a trim command to remove any excess transparency around the subject, and finally saves the images as a layered PSD, and closes the original file without saving changes to preserve my original JPEG. Having the hidden duplicate layer saves me tremendous time when I have to redo some part of the keying process. Instead of having to go back and find the original images to rekey, I have another action whose sole purpose is to delete the layer that was incorrectly keyed in the PSD, copy the hidden layer to a new visible layer, and then rename it to the original layer name so I end up with the PSD file I can take back through the keying process manually to make a better keyed image. I never have to go hunting for the original because it's always with the image I'm working on, just as a hidden layer. The last action that I use extensively creates a subtle drop shadow around my keyed subjects. This lends depth to the subject and mutes some of the hard edge of the keyed image and has the added benefit of helping to hide any small green artifacts that remain. Set your lighting angle to 135 degrees, distance of 9 pixels, spread of 0 pixels, and size of 49 pixels. Instead of being 100% perfect, your keyed image can have a few small imperfections and be covered with the edge shadow effect. So there you go. You're ready to create your own custom composites. Be sure to back up your files to something offline and then consider deleting your intermediate chroma key files when everything's been delivered to the client. You can always rekey them if you need to and you'll free up space for more projects in the future. Have fun with this and don't hesitate to experiment and practice. Enjoy.